tell you about the work that we've done in this uh, very interesting working group. <coughs> I always like to start with a conclusion so that in case the computer crashes or the, or the projector lens blows, then you'll know what I'm talking about in case I run out of time. Uh, loss of control in flights has become the number one cause of aviation fatality. Loss of control can be mitigated through properly de delivered uh, upset prevention and recovery training. And there is no single training solution or tool for UPRT. Integrated academic, simulator, and in-flight training are required. In my presentation, I'll be explaining to you the need, the approach, the training requirements analysis that we've conducted, the discoveries that we have found, the challenges we have to its implementation, and a short conclusion. Lost control fatalities have risen uh, despite improvements in aircraft design and existing training. Why? Let's look at some of the statistics. Looking back in time, CFIT uh, was in the past one of the big issues in aviation safety. There was a technical solution for uh, CFIT that uh, resolved many of the problems. And as we have seen with uh, EGPWS, there's been a, a tremendous improvement in safety in this area. If you look at the statistics of fatalities and fatal accidents before CFIT in 95 to 2004 period, or before EGPWS, you can see the column on the left was the predominant factor. And uh, after the introduction of that uh, new technology, this is what came about. This is a more recent graph from July of 2010 showing that loss of control in flight is the number one cause of those fatalities. So in ICANN, we've started to uh, uh, understand and analyze these incidents. And looking at what the causes are of airplane upsets, this was from a paper uh, presented by Tony Lamrex of the FAA, where he shows that stall flight control systems, uh, spatial disorientation, icing, atmospheric disturbance, and other causes are the reasons for these upsets, with stall being the number one. So if you consider the size of the stall column and the, the impact that that has, that has been a primary area of our attention as well. Now what's going on? Pilots are well trained. Aircraft <coughs> do have protection systems. And stick shakers, stick pushers, uh, audible <coughs> envelope protection, <coughs> angle of attack indications in many cases. So what is going wrong? We started to get information like this. I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, video. I've shortened it here, where you see the Q400 of uh, Colgan Air making its final uh, approach to Buffalo in uh, 2009, entering a stall where the pilots were unaware, did not recognize the developing situation, fought the automation because of program instincts and limitations of their licensing training, as we feel, and ended up in a very difficult position. They fought the system and uh, were not able to uh, apply the right recovery techniques. So then my question out of all of this has been one simple question. What is going on and why? Why are we seeing these events occur still today? When we look at the incidents, are they predictable? No. Is there a likelihood of these happening? Very, very low. They're very rare. The severity is that they're very catastrophic. Once you enter that region, God knows what will happen. It's become a very uh, safety critical, training critical need as a result of that. And the current uh, training standards is untrained or inadequately trained. These are the main conclusions of our group. But the point is that we have been working in this uh, training regime uh, on the premise of uh, four major training assumptions. The aircraft is within the normal operational envelope and in a non-agitated flight condition. Secondly, that situational awareness and information can be accurately correlated by the pilot uh, with respect to the observed flight condition. Thirdly, that airplane handling skills and strategies established by regulatory licensing can directly result in escalating situation or condition. And fourthly, that human psychophysical response is predictable and reliable. For the center of the flight envelope, the normal flight envelope, all of these hold true. Now I will show you that outside the envelope, 
they do not. So, what is an offset? The airplane offset recovery training aim defines offsets uh, by these conditions. If we split those off and looking at attitude and envelope, we get something like this. The pitch attitude greater than 25 nose up or a 10 degrees nose down or a bank angle greater than 45 degrees. And the envelope being the lift, it's a drag, uh, lift over drag and die curve here, uh, where the parameters are exceeded with flying at airspeed inappropriate for those conditions. So, what do we have in the, the situation today? We are trained to fly and we operate within that blue envelope. When we maintain flight within the envelope, things are fine. We're able to manage that. And this is where most of the flight takes place. But if you consider the entire possible <coughs> envelope, it really represents only 4.9% of that complete uh, space that we could end up in. Now, in some uh, licensing training, we can go beyond that. In licensing training, we do uh, uh, tight turns up to 60 degrees and uh, some uh, additional pitch uh, edges. However, being an expert in that blue region does not necessarily mean that you will be an expert in the red region as well. In fact, many of the skills that you have possessed or gained in the blue region may be counterintuitive and counterproductive in the red region. And that is one of our big concerns. So getting outside of the blue region may occur due to atmospheric disturbances, wake vortices, stalls, uh, control system failures, that PIO, prolonged stalls, as you saw in the Golden Air case. So if you are an expert in the blue, it does not necessarily mean that you will be an expert outside, and the licensing skills may make it worse. If you look at the approximate limits that I've drawn here of Colgan uh, 3407, or of the American Airlines 587, where it entered in the PIO, these are approximate, but it shows you where these aircraft entered and did not recover from. Now, we've said that the training assumptions are these, but considering the region outside that central flight region, these, in fact, become four inadvertent assumption excursions. And now I'll explain to you what I mean by that, because we've seen that as you get outside that region, this no longer remains valid. Secondly, if you end up in an upset situation, you're dealing with multiple sources of information occurring rapidly, rapid fire, visual, oral, tactile, vestibular, GQ, all of these things that you may never ever have been exposed to, and certainly not in a time critical situation. So, then we have another uh, fallout. Thirdly, the all envelope knowledge deficiency. Normally, in normal flights, if 99.9% .9 of the time, we operate in this green region, up to uh, L over G max, and it's a very safe region to fly in, and uh, that's the normal flight envelope of the aircraft. However, this is a region that does get trained, but where do we learn to fly up to the maximum stall warning? In the basic training. That's the only time that we're really exposed to it. Now, Suppose an aircraft gets into this lethal region. It's a non-intuitive area. Uh, there's instability uh, happening to the airplane. There's a, a limitation in training that comes into play, minimum loss of altitude. There's very little exposure that we've had to that region, and the risk of negative training as well. And we don't have the abilities to get out of that region. So what we are advocating is recovery techniques First of all, we aim for prevention, but in case an aircraft does get into that uh, dangerous region, we want to promote recovery techniques. Number one being unloading, managing the angle of attack, recognizing the signs, buffet, uh, reduced lateral control, uh, reduced stability. However, the point is we want to split the training in the following way, that in a maneuver oriented training, you would experience a full stall, well, in a line-oriented situation, you would recognize and apply recovery at the very first sight. Okay? So, this is a problem that in that multi-stress environment, the strategies that you have established in licensing training also follow. Now, there's one more 
factor. And that's the human physiological factor, and that is called startle. Dealing with startle is a big challenge. And a key success factor to successful outset prevention and recovery training will be teaching pilots how to deal with startle, how to manage the startle, and how to uh, understand the situation and still recognize and recover in those uh, dangerous environments. Now, how do we do that? So the problem is, what happens now? How are we going to deal with this today? And that's where we have brought about our training philosophy based on the following. It's called Upset Prevention and Recovery Training. So through ICADI, our International Committee for Aviation Training and Extended Envelopes, initiated through this society in this room, at this podium in June 2009, we, with the aim of outfit prevention and recovery training, our mission is to deliver a comprehensive long-term strategy to reduce the rate of uh, loss of control in flight accidents and incidents through enhanced UPRT and to provide those recommendations through ICAO, FAA, and industry. Now, the participants of ICANI, as you can see, cover many different sectors. Uh, we have uh, over 40 organizations and 80, 80 very dedicated individuals. And uh, many times we have uh, 40 or 50 participants at our meetings. This is my dream team at the last meeting at uh, ICAO headquarters in the beginning of this month. And uh, we've had 13 meetings so far where we've brought our teams together, split the task into training and technology analyses, and come with very interesting findings. What are some of those findings? Here we go. Simulators have replaced aircrafts for most training. They're efficient, effective, and safe. However, in UPRT, there is no single tool for optimum training. You have to split it up. And it requires an integration of those elements. First of all, academics. We've been, we've had the luxury of this wonderful resource since 1998 called the Airplane Offset Recovery Training. I've asked a lot of pilots, do they know this document? Many of them don't even know it's existed. Surprisingly enough, it does have its own limitations as well. It's uh, meant for swept wing jets, 100 plus passengers. It's pretty thick. It's very thick to carry around and absorb. It's non-regulated. It's airline operations only, and it's uh, periodically updated. However, we see that this is an opportunity for ICADI to develop manuals that are specifically uh, focused on the main elements of this uh, training team. The second thing is the airplane. We see a need at licensing level training the use of aircraft to provide exposure to the psychological components, the physiological components, and an accurate recovery environment. And that requires qualified aircraft and, you guessed it, qualified instructors. That is an absolutely essential need for all of this to happen. Otherwise, we will have negative training and we will never achieve that goal. I have a short video that will show you my experience that I had, uh, unfortunately, with uh, APS in Arizona, who is a participant in this where uh, we did a simulated approach. A simulator went back to to an ILS. Let's start a turn to the left. That train altitude is 7,400 feet. Our target airspeed is 100 knots. On the team pass in front of us, we can see we have a 757 ahead of us on approach simulated. Uh, it was a, a base same runway. Distance is increasing. Air traffic control advised us of them. We don't really consider it a threat because of the range and it's increasing, okay? Well, it's going to be slow. I've got it on the landing gears coming down on the T-cast. We can see the traffic's now approaching the landing. Runway should not be a factor for us. Glide slope centering. Let's lower the nose about 3 degrees. Readjust power for 100 knots. And we're transmitting final approach.
When you're exposed to that, you really do get startled. Exposure a couple of times really makes you understand how to manage it, and I think that's a very essential part of all this uh, training. The simulator is the most common tool used in training today, so you know that. However, there are current limitations. Also, there are limitations in how we are using simulator today to conduct UPRT, or unusual attitude training. Those are things that we want to address and to standardize through our recommendations. But the number one thing, again, in simulators is this. The cardinal rule, avoid negative training. How do we do that? Again, we come back to the instructor. Through a properly designed instructor page, we can provide the instructor and hence the student feedback on where they have gone in the envelope in terms of the data envelope that's provided by the OEM. Uh, here you see the size of an angle of attack. Uh, for example, you can also provide the VN diagram, the load factors. Have you exceeded that significantly or not? Uh, have you torn off the wings, in other words, during that uh, recovery maneuver? As well as control inputs, as you saw in the American 587 incident, where inappropriate control inputs led uh, as one of the factors to the accident. So with the instructor having this information and being properly trained to provide the training to the, uh, the student, we feel that that can provide a, a great benefit to training, as well as having a display information like this. So our recommendations are going to look like this. Three levels, generic, specific, and recurrent. At the basic levels, <coughs> academic and honor kind of training where generic skills and knowledge are provided and developed to the CPL level. Secondly, at the specific level, academics and simulators for maneuver and line lines of training in order to develop the type rating level. And a scenario based and refresher training at the recurrent level. Now, we've experienced one of our partners in uh, ICANI has already started to implement this uh, lowest level of training with great success, KLM, at their flight academy through APS in Arizona. Very successful and they're very uh, I'm sure that they'll be presenting that uh, at some time in the near future as well. Uh, recommendations that we're making to the FAA, or have already made to the FAA, I should say. Through the stall uh, stall and stick pusher working group, we've uh, made some recommendations. The stick pusher and uh, adverse weather aviation rulemaking committee has received the ICAO inputs. ICAO is going to be receiving a manual of offset prevention recovery training. References in ICAO annexes and PANS training, uh, training manuals for pilot, instructor, regulator, and operator, as well as similar technical standards uh, in an appendix form for 9625 or other documents. And we will produce an I, uh, ICAO report on research and technology findings. So, in conclusion, onset events are rare, but they are catastrophic. UPRT is critical to safety for the prevention and when the aircraft is outside the envelope and agitated, situational awareness is degraded, licensing training has not provided the recovery skills, and psychophysical balance are challenged. The integration of the academics and the simulator and in-flight training is key, and proper instruction is a vital factor in making it successful. Our dream, our hope, is that we will see something like this in the near future as a result of our hard work and dedicated team. And looking to the future, we know that aircraft have evolved. We know that flight techs and automation have evolved. However, what will not change, it will still be the same human flying the airplane. We have to train and instruct that the person to be able to deal with those situations. And as Mark so rightfully said, we have to keep thinking differently. Before I conclude, I would like to ask the members of ICADI who are in this room to please stand up because I'd like to share in the applause 